I'm going to be talking today about uh, theory and history. It mainly is found in uh, Mises' book of uh, theory and history, came out in 1957, although I won't limit it to that book alone. Uh, now, when we talk about history, we can mean this in two different senses, what we'd say pro uh, problems of history. On the one hand, uh, we're talking about philosophy of history. On the one, time, one hand, philosophy of history, we can refer to a view that there's some sort of pattern or explanation of history as a whole. Uh, say, if we have conventional histories, we have, say, history of America or history of Europe or history of the ancient world. Now, there are some, a few historians who have thought that that isn't enough. All of these histories can be fitted within some larger pattern that explains the whole thing. As one writer of that group, John McMurray, had a book with the title The Clue to History. So in this notion of philosophy of history, there's some kind of pattern or explanation of all historical events or the most important historical events. And in many cases, people who go in for that sort of philosophy of history think that one can know the future as well. The pattern extends not only to the present, but can go on to the future. You don't have to think it can go on, you can know the future to have a philosophy of history. Hegel, at least arguably, didn't think that. He thought that there was a philosophy of history, but the philosophy was limited to what had come about in the present. He couldn't foretell what would come next. Now, there's a second sense of philosophy of history, which refers to something else, and this would be uh, problems of writing history, or what is when a historian is engaged in writing history, how, what is the nature of his activity? How do we get historical knowledge? How do we know that propositions about the past are true? Uh, Mises made contributions to both of these areas, both this philosophy of history and this first sense of pattern of history as a whole, and also to the uh, other one on problems of historical method, of how we know historical facts. You see, if you talking about that sense of history, you're not at all presupposing that there's some kind of philosophy of history in the first sense. You're not presupposing that there's some kind of pattern that explains all of history. I'll be concentrating mainly on the first part, this view that there are patterns in history as a whole. I should say this is a topic notion of, of theory and history. It's one of particular interest to me because uh, I was trained as a historian. Most of my work since then has been more in philosophy than history. The reason for that is I found it was much easier. You see, in history, you have to do a whole lot of research, digging into archives. In philosophy, all you have to do is come up with arguments, so it's, it's much easier, and I, I'm very lazy, so I thought that would be the thing to do. Uh, now, I want, uh, we, uh, in considering uh, philosophies of history in this first sense of patterns of history, uh, we want to ask why was Mises interested in philosophy of history in this sense? Why was he interested in theories that claim there was some sort of pattern that explains the whole of history. Uh, well, you remember uh, from your reading of Mises, and I mentioned this in my lecture on praxeology, he was interested in attacks on economics, on economics as he conceived it. And many of the philosophers of history, many of those who thought there was a pattern to history, have had views that are 
if they were right, would be opposed to his conception of economics. In what way? Well, in the theories that say there's a pattern of history, very often, although this isn't required to have such a theory, but very often those theories will say that there are various stages of history or various cultures, and each one of those stages or cultures will have separate laws that are characteristic only of it. So very often those theories will say that there aren't universal laws of economics. They'll, uh, the German historical school remember, held a similar view, and there's somewhat very often uh, these views held views of the same kind, although uh, not invariably so. But So very, these views very often said, History doesn't, I mean, that economics doesn't have universally applicable law. So Mises was interested in refuting these theories, at least to the extent they did so. And the one I want to concentrate the most on is one that was uh, very influential in the late 19th and most of the 20th century. It's gone on uh, bad days uh, since the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, and this is Marxism. In theory and history, uh, Mises gives a very penetrating criticism of Marxism, and I want to concentrate in this lecture a great deal on that. Uh, I, sh I know something about uh, Marx. I'm not, uh, I would say I know some Marx, but I don't know all the angles. So uh, <laughs> I, I, once tried, I once gave that joke at a conference in uh, Jerry Cohen or G.A. Cohen, very outstanding philosopher, told me he'd come up with the same joke. So I thought I must be on the right. At least we agreed on something. Uh, all right, now, the essential of the Marxist theory of history is something like this. Uh, Marx thought that the dominant force in history was uh, what he called the forces of production, the force of production are roughly equivalent to the technology uh, available at a particular time, the uh, machines or the tools, the, for the various uh, methods that are used in producing things. And he thought, Marx thought, there's a constant tendency throughout history for these forces of production to develop. Now, as the forces of production develop throughout history, they're always growing, we're always getting more and more advanced technology, uh, there are various types of social organization that correspond to the various stages in the growth of technology. And Marx called these various ways of organizing society in response to the uh, forces of production, the relations of production. So you have their forces of production and their relations of production, which is how society is organized to develop these forces of production. Now, in the relations of production, at least during most times, we'll see a bit later, there are two exceptions to this. The relations of production are characterized by struggles between competing classes. Uh, the competing classes are the uh, producers, the workers, of, and the exploiters. So they're different uh, types of workers and exploiters in each of the stages. So uh, you see, it's a, you have various stages of what's called, following this uh, a stadial theory of history. I'll put this down. This comes from the Scottish Enlightenment, stadial theory, meaning one in stages. So the way in the Marxist theory you have, you start off, let's put this at the bottom here, you have a stage uh, called primitive communism. 
Now, in this, this is sort of uh, before the society was really organized. It's the first uh, stage. You have people who are just in very small groups, and there aren't classes. This is one of the two exceptions I mentioned. I said when relations of production are always classes, but there are two exceptions. This is one of the two exceptions. So there isn't a div uh, division of labor. It's not much division of labor. There aren't classes. Then you have primitive communism. Everything is shared in common. Here are the main Marxists who wrote on primitive communism and Marx went along with this, was uh, Marx's longtime friend and collaborator, uh, Friedrich Engels. And, uh, Engels, in turn, was drawing on research by the American anthropologist Lewis Henry Morgan. Uh, and Marx uh, took over. Engels wrote a book on this, something like The Origins of the Family, Private Property in the State, and Marx took over his view. And then... After, you see, you have the primitive communism, you couldn't, under primitive communism, you couldn't develop the forces of production very much. They didn't have division of labor. Then, you remember, according to Marx, there is a constant tendency for the forces of production to develop. So Marx holds that as the forces of production develop, you'll have a new a new stage, a new relations of production, and those relations of production will be the ones that, at the time, are best suited to develop the forces of production. So after you have primitive communism, then you have uh, uh, slavery, which is characteristic of the ancient world, where you have a uh, the production takes place through slave labor and there's a class who is in control and they're benefiting from the slaves labor. So Marx helped, Marx thought at that time in the ancient world when slavery was in effect that was required by history because then slavery was the best means to develop the forces of production and you remember at that according to Marx the what we have in society is the uh, with relation to production will be those that at the time best develop the forces of production. Now, as the, as the forces of production continue to grow, remember this is this tendency the forces have; they're always getting uh, growing more and more. Technology is always developing it will no longer be the case that the forces of production, I mean, that, that slavery is the system that's best suited to develop the forces of production. So what used to be the best system, what used to be the system best suited to develop the force of production, ceases to be so. It's no longer the best system. And it's then... Class conflicts arise, you know, in the, say, in the system of the ancient world, the slaves obviously would not be very happy about being enslaved. And as the system breaks down because it will, can no longer develop the force of production, the class conflicts intensify. So eventually the slave system is overthrown and then it's replaced by the new system, feudalism, which is the system in the Middle Ages. In the Marxist account of feudalism, it isn't characterized as it's done by many non-Marxist historians as a kind of, as a relationship principally between a lord and his vassals. What the Marxists have in mind by feudalism is this uh, notion of uh, the economic system where labor is done by serfs, who serfs are not slaves, that they're bound to the land, but they're not owned by the by the barons or lords. You have you're just required to work to give a certain part of your of your produce to the lord, and you're not unless the 
Lord gives you permission. You can't leave what you're doing, but you're not enslaved to the Lord. You're not working under his supervision so long as you give him what you require, your, fu- your futile dues to him. So again, Mark says, this is the best way to develop the forces of production at that time. Now, you'll not be surprised to find out that after a while, this system, this, these relations of production, characteristics of feudalism, are no longer suited to develop the forces of production as the force of production keep going, or just keep going more and more. So now, feudalism is then replaced by capitalism. And here, of course, the main social conflict, the main co- class conflict, is between the workers, who are the Marx called the proletarians, and the capitalists, the exploiters. And Marx thought that as the capitalism develops, again, it's required to develop the force of production, Marx get, has a very glowing account of how capitalism develops the forces of production. After a while, though, he says that the the, the capitalist system becomes fetters on the force of production, chains on the force of production, and then this will be overthrown and we'll have a new system, socialism, that will replace it. Uh, Now, sometimes uh, people distinguish two stages of socialism. There's a higher stage called communism and socialism, but I don't think we need to go into the exact differences. But the point that's important for our purposes is that according to, uh, according to Marx, the forces of production require that capitalism be overthrown and this new system will replace it in which you'll have centralized production. And this whole story has a very happy ending, according to Marx, because under socialism, there aren't any class conflicts anymore. In in all the previous system, except for primitive communism, you had class conflicts. You have the uh, slaves versus the owners under slavery. You have the... um, the lords and the, the serfs under feudalism, you have the uh, capitalists and proletariat under capitalism, but now under socialism, you don't have any class conflict. So according to Marx, then, there are no further stages. This is the final stage. We've reached the end, and everything will work out for the best. The force of production will continually develop well, there'll be no more conflict and we reach the final goal. Uh, I should mention before going on to Mises' criticism that this is one way of understanding Marx, Marxism. Uh, Mises uh, principally relied on, uh, here in his interpretation, on the great uh, Russian social democratic Marxist uh, Plakhanov. Uh, I think this is a very plausible interpretation of Marx. There are some writers who stress class conflict more than Plakhanov did in this, this view that Mises took. It's more of a technological determinism. It's the forces of production that are really the main uh, factor driving history. And the interpretation that Mises gave was, and Paul Fahn Plakhanov was also adopting what's, I think, is the, by far the best defense of the Marxist view, which is by uh, G.A. Cohen, a book called Karl Marx's Theory of History, a Defense. Uh, Cohen, you'll remember, was the man who came up with the same joke as I did, so he, he's at least not all bad. <laughs> he, he was, in fact, a very outstanding philosopher. He was one of the best philosophers. But he had the, his interpretation, so you shouldn't think that 
Mises' interpretation of uh, Marx is idiosyncratic. It's supported by the best modern uh, Marxist authority. Now, what are some of, how did Mises respond to this whole very elaborate theory? Now, one thing you'll remember, I hope, from uh, the, your studies of praxeology, there's a fundamental principle of praxeology called methodological individualism, that only individuals act. And the Marxist theory, as I've explained it, violates that principle in the most fundamental way because it, it says that it treats the forces of production as if it were some independent entity that's just growing automatically. And as Mises points out, uh, why the force of production don't develop unless particular people have ideas that they then put into effect to have more and better technology. There's nothing at all automatic. We shouldn't think that the forces of production are just developing just by themselves automatically. So in this very fundamental way, the Marx, Marx whole system is flawed from the start. There is no tendency of the force of production just to grow by themselves. I think we, it's roughly true that their uh, later periods in history tend to be more technologically developed than earlier ones. By no means always the case. For example, the in the Roman Empire, uh, they were aware of how to produce steel, although they didn't produce much, but they had they knew about the technique. You know, <coughs> in Latin, the word ferrum, which is usually translated iron, can also also mean steel. They they knew about steel, so it isn't always true that technology is is always bet more later than earlier, but. Even though it is that is largely true, it's by no means the case that technology always develops constantly. Now, there is another basic Misesian criticism that we can raise against uh, Marxism. Marxism. Now, you remember I said that Marx holds that at various stages in history. There are different social systems, different relations of production that at that particular time are best suited to develop the force of production. In the ancient world, it was slavery. Then in the Middle Ages, it's feudalism. In uh, the 19th century, when he wrote, it was capitalism. And then socialism would develop the force of production later. But... If you accept the Mises account of economics, it's always the case that capitalism, that the free market, will best develop the force of production. It's the only, according to Mises, it's the only efficient system of production. So it's always the case that if we had a free market, then that would best develop whatever the technology available at the time was. It isn't the case that, say, in the ancient world, uh, capitalism couldn't, wouldn't develop the force of production. And Marx gives no, nowhere any arguments that the systems that prevailed at that time were best suited to develop the force of production. So even if you don't accept uh, Misesian economics, of course, if you don't, you'll have to be immediately expelled from this, this institution. But even if you didn't accept that, you would have no re Marx had given us no reason to think that the uh, different these other social systems best develop the force of production at that time. Uh, we can add a variation of this. Uh, it just if we concentrate on capitalism, which is the system that uh, Marx wrote the most about, you know, in his famous book of 
1867 Das Kapital, that was the only, only one volume, came out uh, during his lifetime, and there's the second and third volume were edited from his manuscripts by uh, Friedrich Engels. But if you t- just concentrate on capitalism, uh, we in transition to socialism, we could say Marx was wrong to say that socialism would develop the force of production better than capitalism because, as Mises showed in his socialist calculation argument, the socialist economy couldn't work at all because it would be unable to calculate lacking a market that could establish prices by which we could tell how resources could be used efficiently. So if you wanted to have a Marxist view that the system in place is the one that best develops the forces of reduction, you could have a Marxist argument for capitalism, for the free market. You would say, well, you want the system that, you have to have a system that best develops the force of reduction, and that system is the free market. So, in fact, there are Marxists who've taken rather that line. Uh, you remember the conflict before the Re- Russian Revolution between uh, the Mensheviks who were the, uh, in the uh, Bolsheviks. The Bolsheviks were the ones who became the Russian Communist Party. The Mensheviks were the, although they were, the Russian words mean minority, they were actually a larger party. party. And the, the Mensheviks held that before we can have socialism, Capitalism has to develop to the full extent possible. So they favor, they said, no, no, we shouldn't have a revolution in Russia right now because uh, capitalism hasn't fully developed yet. And there, there are some Marxists, like there's a um, Marxist named Magnod Desai who teaches in London, and he says we might have to have capitalism for hundreds of years yet because capitalism hasn't fully developed. So you see, we could have, if we wanted a Marxist argument for capitalism, of course, that would be flawed because uh, we don't have any argument for the view that we have to have a system that best develops the force of production, but the Marxist view would then fail on its own terms. It wouldn't show that socialism is required. Uh, Now, there's a uh, third way that Mises criticizes uh, Marxism is that uh, this is the one where he's particularly concerned with how views in these kinds of philosophy of history that question the universality of economic laws. Uh, Marx held that... uh, Thinking is determined by what your class is. Uh, say in the capitalism, the proletarian thinking is very different from bourgeois thinking. They're sort of each class has its own characteristic methods of thought. Uh, and if this is the case, then you don't have, you wouldn't have universal laws. You would have, you might have particular classes claiming their universal laws, but they would be doing this just out of their own class interests. So Marx, and their different views on how strict he was in this sort of determinism, but Marx generally reduces theoretical ideas to class interest. In Mises, as you'll remember from the Praxeology lecture, is very critical of this. He says this is what he calls polylogism. It's the view that different classes or different groups have different logic, and he rejects this. He said, no, there's just a single logic that's valid for everybody. Uh, Now, in addition to the criticisms of uh, Marxism that Mises raises in theory and history, he, he, one of his most fundamental contributions, I think, to the criticism of Marxism is one that he had of Marx's explanation of profit. And I want to go into that a little bit it's because this is one of the 
keys to the entire Marxist analysis of capitalism. Uh, court, uh, when Marx was talking about profit, he had in mind not entrepreneurial profit, but more of a rate of return uh, on capital, and also this would include rent. So the problem Marx raises is this. Uh, supposing we have uh, an, exche uh, an exchange of the capitalist takes, uh, gets, bought, buys some raw material, then works on this, it works on this, and then sells the product. How can it be that what he gets in, for selling the product turns out to be more than the cost that he expended in all the raw materials and all the costs he had for labor? How does he, how does the capitalist earn a rate of return. Uh, you might say, well, he's very, the capitalist is very good because he, he's, he's very enterprising. He can see that there are certain opportunities for profit you know, by producing goods that people want. But according to Marx, this won't explain why there's a rate of return on capital in equilibrium. Uh, if uh, say he sees a profit opportunity in this sense, say, he, why aren't the uh, costs of the raw materials simply bid up so that he doesn't earn such returns anymore? How is it that they're a rate of interest at all? Of course, in the Austrian view, this is explained through time preference, but Marx had a different explanation. He, he said, according to his theory of value, the value of any commodity is the socially necessary labor time required to produce it. So you would have, uh, say, you want to determine what's the value of an apple. It would be how much time is required to produce an apple. It's, uh, you know, if somebody spends much more time than others, that wouldn't count. I mean, he's producing an apple of greater value. He's taking this as kind of an average number of hours required to produce something. So according to Marx, and this is very oversimplified because he has later accounts, that, later things that modify this, but commodities exchange according to the labor time required to produce them. So according to him, then what would be the value of labor? What would be the price of labor according to this theory? the value of commodities, the labor required to produce it. Now, you might think that that question doesn't have an answer in the labor theory of value because labor is the standard that you're measuring all the other commodities by. You say the value of the commodity is the labor time required to produce it. So labor time doesn't have a value. That's what you're using to measure everything else. So that... You, that is left indeterminate in the Marxist system. But Marx said, no, no, that's not right. That isn't, uh, you do are able to determine the value of labor because what you would get, what you would be trying to determine is the value of the laborer, how much time is required to produce the person who's laboring. Basically, what are the cost of all the commodities he needs to survive and to raise his family. So the cost of production of, of labor is what it requ was required to produce the, the labor. Now here's where, this is the part where we have to be concentrate especially hard to get the whole key to the mystery according to Marx. Here's the key to profit. Supposing the capitalist gives the worker what's required to produce him what he needs to survive on. What is he getting in return? According to Marx, he's getting all the labor hours that are available for whatever the time of work that he's contracted to. Marx always gives these extremely long hours, say somebody's working 23 hours a day or 
of course, a seven-day week. We wouldn't think of anything else. I mean, uh, so he he uh, he's he's pay, the capitalist is paying for the labor the labor what's required for his production, but he's getting return all these labor hours, the labor power for all these hours, and this will turn out to be more than what he's paying the labor. So here, the labor is getting his full value, according to the Marxist system, because he's getting what's required to produce him. And remember, any commodity, including labor, the value of it is the number of hours required to produce it. But in return, the capitalist is getting more labor hours. And remember, labor hours are what creates value. So this is how he gets his profit. Marx uses the neutral term exploitation to <laughs> describe this relationship. Now, uh, Mises' fundamental point here, which very few writers have seen, but Mises thinks this, this is entirely wrong, that there's no, re- that if you, if, say, there was a system of slavery, then the value of the labor would indeed be re- the labor time required to produce the labor. But that isn't true in a market system, that the worker isn't required to sell himself. He, he, he may have to, he may need to take a job, but he isn't required to sell himself according to this uh, this uh, system. It's just, uh, so it isn't at all the case that the value of, of the labor is determined. We were right the first time in the labor theory of value. There isn't any way of determining the price of labor. So this is the fundamental point Mises raised to criticize the Mar- Marxist economic system. He says, uh, in the Marxist theory, really, wage rates are indeterminate. When Marx talks about workers receiving subsistence, this is just a placeholder, really, for uh, saying that he doesn't have an account of why workers receive a particular wage, so he doesn't have an account of profit at all. Now, uh, Mises raises, doesn't confine his criticism of these philosophies of history to Marxism. He also deals with other, other sorts of criticism. Uh, other historians, for example, there was a great uh, 20th century philosopher of history, a German writer, Oswald Spengler. Uh, have any of you read Spengler? Uh, oh, just uh, just one person. Well, then I'll be fairly safe in just making up things about it. Uh, well, uh, Spengler had the view that it, it, instead of having a, a theory where there's a plot to all of history, where it develops from a primitive stage to some highest stage, as in Marx, of primitive communism, to... Uh, communism at the end. You start with communism and end in communism. There's a lot of stuff going on in between. But Spengler had a different view. He had a view where there are separate civilizations. He thought there were about seven of these separate civilizations, and they all go through similar stages from uh, their origin to their decline. He compared uh, cultures to plants which have a grow from seeds and then bloom and finally fall into decay. And you remember his famous book is called The Decline of the West. It came out uh, just at the end of World War I. So he, he thought we were in a stage, civilization, according to him, it's used, is kind of this declining stage where the, in his view, the culture is will no long is, Western culture is no longer creative and will now be in a period where technology will be primary and will have the rule of the Caesars. Will have very large cities. He 
use the word megalopolis to describe these cities and we'll have uh, wars and uh, technology, I mean, uh, it will have Caesarism and militarism in this final stage. Uh, Mises gives a, has some treatment of him and he criticizes him for this polylogist view that people have different sorts of uh, logics or different patterns of thinking. For example, Spengler held that the Greeks had a completely different view of space and time from that characteristic of Western man. The Greeks didn't have a notion of infinity, uh, whereas we do, we have, uh, they, he, and he had, very often Spengler had very imaginative accounts of uh, architecture and relating them to mathematics, and he was very good at drawing out historical analogies, but his system is Mises points out is fundamentally flawed. We can see we can see this. Mises asks a basic question: If these cultures are supposed to be different, they have all these very different ways of looking at uh, the past, and they have different patterns of thought. How is it that Spengler himself is able to understand all these different patterns? He's limited to uh, his own culture, that of contemporary Western man. So how is it on his own system he's able to understand all these different cultures? It seems like a uh, somewhat of a contradictory position to adopt. Uh, now, in the time that's left, I said we don't have very much time, but we have some, I want to say a little bit about the other part of philosophy of history, and that is to say, uh, not the view where we're talking about what are the pa- views that claim there's some sort of pattern to history as a whole, some sort of clue to the whole of history, but rather the question of historical knowledge. How does the historian, meaning by that, not a, one of these philosophers of history in this rather grandiose sense, but conventional history, how do we attain historical knowledge? Uh, According to Mises, and here he was uh, in the tradition of some of the uh, German thinkers such as Wilhelm Diltai, I'll put him down, uh, uh, and Max Weber, great uh, German sociologist whom he knew personally, and also the, uh, there, there were other, the one he particularly thought highly of the uh, British philosopher, historian, archaeologist, uh, R.G. Collingwood. Uh, And also the uh, Italian philosopher, uh, Benedetto Croce. Uh, Now, according to these writers, there's a historian operates according to a, a different way of thinking from that of the natural scientist. Remember, uh, according to Mises, we can, in praxeology, know certain general characteristics of action just by thinking about them. We know, say, any action involves the use of means to attain an end. We We know general truths about action. Now, we can't know just by thinking about them particular actions, but according to Mises and people in this tradition, we can uh, think the thoughts of past historical actors. We can describe a certain situation and try to imagine if we had, say we imagine if we had certain beliefs and desires in that situation, how would we act? How would we act in that situation given these beliefs and desires? For example, supposing we have the problem of uh, Caesar in defying the Roman Senate uh, crossed the Rubicon River in 49 BC. Why did he do that? Well, uh, you know, we can look at various historical documents. There's one account that he said something like, uh, if I, uh, 
or if I uh, uh, disobey the Senate, this will cause, uh, this will, this is a bad thing to do. You know, I wouldn't want to disobey the Senate, but I'll lose honor if I, if I don't cross the river, so let's go ahead and do it. So uh, what we would do is try to, taking certain, uh, imagine, according to the documents, think of what beliefs and desires Caesar had, Caesar had, and then try to say how would we act in given those beliefs and desires. And we would be able, by doing that, to understand how he acted. And this is usually, this process is usually called by the German word uh, verstehen, which means uh, to understand. Uh, so we rather we think ourselves into the way the actor, the past actors have acted. We have kind of an intuitive process of understanding. This is not one, Mises was anxious to stress it, based on kind of an emotional empathy. It's more one we're trying to reconstruct the thought of the past actor. Uh, now, there's a competing view to the one uh, Mises adopted. This is one ones that was, this theory was favored by the logical positivists and also by Karl Popper. Uh, the positivists is very frequently come out as Mises' opponents. And what their view was that it isn't that the historian doesn't rely principally on Frischte, and they thought maybe you could try to imagine yourself into various past historical events in the way Mises and those in this tradition had suggested. But this really wouldn't, this was really not very scientific. You would just have, this is just, you might be able to come up with guesses of how people had acted, but this wouldn't really tell you anything scientifically. What you had to do if you wanted to do correct scientific history would be to come up with general laws of history. You would say uh, something like you want to explain uh, why Caesar crossed the Rubicon in 49 BC. You say whenever someone is in a situation of such and such a kind, he will do this. Say whenever uh, someone who has dictatorial aspirations is faced with an obstacle of some kind, he will respond in such and such a way. There's a famous article by the positivist philosopher uh, uh, Karl Hempel called The Function of General Laws in History. It came out in 1942, which is probably the most important article favoring this view. I'll put him down as well. Why not? Uh, so here's a competing, the competing view. The, the Musesian view is we have explained historical events through this process of understanding through Frischte. And the competing view is no, this won't give you scientific history. In order to do that, you'll have to come up with general laws in history. Now, uh, I'd like to ask, uh, can you see what would be the principal problem with this view that the positivist has, that the function of the historian, the historian explains events by subsuming them under general laws of history? Anybody? Uh, yes? The same events don't occur twice? Uh, well, I think that's certainly right, but I mean, why couldn't you have... Uh, Event, certain event types always follow certain laws. I mean, say you just have in a scientific law, you could say uh, particular samples of water are always different from others, but they all can be analyzed as composed of H2O. So how would that solve? Uh, yeah? No, value is subjective, and you can never know what someone else's values are. Uh, well, I don't know that you could... There'd be two problems with that. I mean, maybe you could know what particular people's values are. I mean, you would have a pretty good idea. Caesar was not, would not have the same values as, say, a hermit retiring to uh, 
uh, his own private meditation. He would cer- you could certainly know, I think, that Caesar was pretty ambitious, and you might not, the general laws might not refer to people's values at all. Uh, well, I'll try. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, that's just denying the hypothesis that the, the general law, I mean, maybe, I mean, uh, or you could also say, why isn't that simply uh, an example of a general problem in induction? Uh, but that doesn't stop us from being, I'll just give you one hint. Think of something very simple, a very simple criticism. Uh, all right, I'll try one more. Uh, all right. Yeah. Perhaps because... Um Unlike the natural sciences, the factors are going to be invariable compared to your situation. It, it, the fact, variable. variable. Uh, well, again, that's just denying the hypothesis. Well, all right, I'll, I'll give you at least my answer. It's, it's quite easy. Uh, there aren't any such general... Nobody's ever come up with any valid general laws at all. So <laughs> there just aren't any. You could say, if this view is right, then there aren't any historical explanations at all. So that's really the fundamental problem with it. Nobody's ever come up with uh, exceptionless laws or even laws that are close to being exceptionless. And Hempel never did that. And also, if you look at the article, see, he never gives any arguments for the view that uh, historical explanation has to take this form. It's just sort of, uh, he just seems to assume that's what explanation is, so you don't really need any any further thing. Uh, well, I could say, uh, I was going to say something on uh, how Mises is Mises, what Mises has to say about uh, explaining the Industrial Revolution and the Depression, but I think in the time left, I think I'll just uh, throw it open for questions. We seem to have a lot. Uh, Max? Doesn't Mises open up the possibility that, that it could be the case, that in the future it could be the case that laws are known? Uh, well, what he says is, I recall, I mean, he doesn't rule out the possibility of there being deterministic laws that explain human behavior, but I think he holds that we wouldn't be able to know what those laws were. But even if we did, they wouldn't be law, uh, particular laws of history. They would be more, I think what he would have in mind, more physical laws. So that would be really, if that possibility were to be eventuate, that would be really reducing history to something else. It wouldn't be historical laws of a type that Hempel had in mind. The type of laws Hempel had in mind were laws uh, that referred specifically to event, historical event types of various kinds. Uh, yeah. Professor Hansel Mahoba wrote a paper, an essay on uh, Austrian class analysis versus mm-hmm. Marxist class analysis. Mm-hmm. In that paper, he used the 10 predictions of Marxism. Mm-hmm. of the philosophy of history. And at the end, uh, well, uh, Hoppe corrected the, the <coughs> Marxist theory of exploitation and, uh, and private property. And at the end, uh, Hoppe concludes that some of the predictions are really good. For example, the last one, when Hoppe, when Hoppe and Marx, and even uh, Rothbard said that uh, uh, because of the government, explo- the, that the, the, the exploitative, those are the exploitators, they're going to create an economic crisis, and that's going to create the, the objective uh, conditions for a revolution, and that's going to that's going to be that's going to be the the last step for prosperity and economic growth. Is there any way to make some praxeological historical laws, something like that, like like Hoppe did? Kind of? uh, well, I think uh, you, it's certainly a very important article that Hans Hoppe wrote there. Uh, I would think that the what he's come up with, we would have good grounds for accepting what he said, but I don't think they would be praxeological laws. They would be something like uh, hypotheses about history that are supported by certain kinds of evidence. I don't think one could say that would, one could conclude just by thinking about it that a social crisis would have to come about, say, by the government uh, doing various things. That would be a particular hypothesis that 
could be investigated. I mean, it, uh, it's certainly suggested, but I don't think it would be praxeology. I don't think he claims that it is praxeology, but uh, I mean, uh, he would be the best person to ask about that. Uh, yeah? Uh, Marx stated that uh, our consciousness is dictated by uh, the relationship to production. But um, what would he say to uh, early communist sects in the, during the feudal age? What would he say to? Uh, early communist sects like the uh, Anabaptists or, or some other movement. Uh, well, uh, uh, what would he say about movements such as the Anabaptists? Well, I mean, you would, this process wouldn't be ones that invariably operate in a certain way. I mean, the, the, the determination isn't of a very strict kind, so you could have people who had certain beliefs that went, were very different from that characteristic of their social period. But he thought that, uh, for the most part, uh, the, eco the economic relation of production determined the ideology that people Hell, but he didn't claim this was invariably the case. So I think he would just say that's an exception. It doesn't always work out. You I mean, of course, you could say, why did he? He was a member of the bourgeois class. How did he come up with his idea? He didn't claim that. He didn't think that was contradictory. He just thought that the certain intellectuals had an interest in supporting the advancing class, and he was one of them. Uh, uh, yeah. Since you, the stages begin with communism and end with communism, mm -hmm. the forces of production stop after well, it gets to uh, the last stage? No, no, the force of production continue to develop, but there's no more conflict, so there's no way the system would be overthrown. We've reached the ideal system. In the previous system, there's conflict among classes, but under socialism and communism, you, know, you don't have conflicting classes. I meant the original primitive communism. Oh. There's no class conflict. Oh, there's no I, I, forces of production. Right. So you get to the end, why would there still be forces of production? Well, there, there's no force of, Well, you don't have the forces of production. You have very limited technology at the beginning, but technology keeps growing and growing. It isn't that the forces of production are, are inherently uh, inimical to... Communism, it's just that at particular stages, say when you had forced production developing, then according to Marx, you required a class system when they were at sort of that extent. But at, if they've developed to the highest extent, then communism is the best system. So if somehow magically we could take the, our technology and apply it, to, uh, put it in with primitive communism, then every, that would be all right. That wouldn't stop the force production from de, force production to develop. It's just that the very limited force of production couldn't develop under primitive communism. So it's a theory. Particular stages in development of force production require particular social systems, you see. Uh, yes? Um, you say in response to Empel that uh, Mises that there are no exceptionalist laws we can use? Uh, yeah, I mean, that there aren't people, he hasn't come up with such laws. Hasn't come up yes, with or no one else has either. Oh, okay, but Mises still holds by praxeology that there are laws of behavior that we can use. Yeah, yes, but you see, those are universal laws. They aren't, those are laws that are about the general form of an action. They don't tell us anything about particular actions. They don't, I mean, say we have praxeological law, you always choose your highest valued end. We don't have praxeological laws that say something like any dictator will act in such and such a way when faced with opposition. Uh, all right, well, I guess we're out of time. Thanks very much.